when we talk about evangelism and inviting, what are we offering? How can we help? And what do we, as followers of Jesus Christ, need in order to be effective in sharing our faith? First, what are we offering? We're offering the gospel. We are offering the good news of God's grace, that though we are sinful, though we are broken, though we are rebellious, though we are wicked, God loves us in spite of us. That though we as humanity and we as individuals have continued to run away from God throughout all history, God has continued to pursue us. That God left heaven, that God became a man, that he suffered in our place, that, that Jesus died on a cross in our place for our sin, to pay the penalty for our sin. And he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave to prove and to validate that his promises are true. That, that he hasn't, he didn't just come to deal with our guilt and shame and say, oh no, it'll be okay. No, he came and he validated his claims. That in the resurrection, we see that the power of sin has been broken and even the power of death itself has been destroyed. In the gospel, we proclaim the hope of, of recreation and of reconciliation that we would be reconciled with God and that through our reconciliation with God, we could be reconciled with each other. We proclaim the hope of recreation. Again, that we could be made new, that we could be recreated from the inside out, not by doing better and trying harder, but by faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is the gospel. This is what we share. But how do we share it? How do we share it with the vastly different kinds of people that we hope to lead to Christ? Bottom line, how can we help? First, let's talk about outsiders. What do I even mean by an outsider? How can we, how can we help them? Who are they? What do they need? When I say outsiders, I'm thinking of friends and family, classmates and coworkers, neighbors and strangers who happen to be on the outside of the Christian faith looking in. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. You know, some are, some have labels or some would give themselves labels. They'd say, I'm an atheist or I'm agnostic. Some people on the outside of the Christian faith, they're, they're angry or antagonistic. Others, they're indifferent or just kind of oblivious to the things of God. They come in all shapes and sizes. I mean, my kids, they were never hostile to the gospel. It's all they ever knew. They, grow, they grew up in a home where all they ever heard about was the love of God through Jesus Christ. And yet they began as outsiders. And we all begin as outsiders. We begin as people who do not know God. What does an outsider need? An outsider needs to learn about God's love, both through the gospel and through God's people. Again, an outsider, they need to learn about God's love, both through the gospel and through God's people. They need to understand what I've already shared, that God became a man to seek and to save, not just a category of lost people. No, he came to seek and to save them. He came in order that they might be reconciled to him because he loves them. He, he came to offer them hope in love. In understanding the gospel, they need to under, come to understand the wickedness of man and the holiness of God. They need to come to understand sin and righteousness, faith and repentance, justice and forgiveness. They need to understand that Jesus Christ died in their place in order to absorb God's wrath in order that the penalty for sin might be paid so that they could be reconciled to God by grace through faith. But one of the things we struggle with is sometimes we assume that they need to understand all of that in like one 60 second conversation or through one track or through one encounter. And, and if, they, if they grasp that, if God opens up their eyes and they receive the whole message and understand in one sitting, that is beautiful. But more often, what an outsider needs is time and opportunity to come to see and to know and to experience and to understand the love of God. And that happens both through a greater understanding of the gospel 
and also by seeing and experiencing and understanding God's love through his people. So practically speaking, perhaps one of the first ways that we can help is, is simply by loving people well and beginning to share the gospel with them. And if, if you're not comfortable to share the gospel or maybe you're afraid that you're going to get something wrong, the first step might be to just invite other people into your life and into your home and into your relationships. Maybe it's into some sort of informal social setting where, where they're not just getting to know you, but getting to know other people in the church. Or you invite them into a small group or you, you invite them on a Sunday morning. One of the things we see in the Gospel of John is as the early followers of Jesus, as they were being called as disciples, as they were getting excited about the possibility that Jesus really might be the coming Messiah, uh, we, we see this scene where, where Philip's been called by God, and yet he doesn't have any answers yet. He doesn't, he doesn't know much of anything. And Nathaniel, he's, he's a little bit of a skeptic, and he's pushing back, and, and he's got questions. And, and Philip's just like, dude, I don't know, but come and see. Because, because I think that there's something here and I want to share it with you. And maybe it's just that simple, that we invite other people to come and see. We invite them into, into our lives and we love them well. Bottom line, for those who are on the outside of the Christian faith looking in, they need to see and experience and understand God's love, both through the gospel and through his people. And as they increasingly understand the gospel and find loving relationships among us. They move on to the next stage and what I would call that next stage would be explorers. So they're increasingly informed and connected. Um, they, they may have a genuine interest in the things of God or it might just be that they, they like the donuts that we put out on Sunday morning or they, they enjoy the conversations, they like the community. We don't know. But again, they're getting connected, they're gaining understanding. And as we look out over the church lobby, you can't, you can't tell the difference between someone who has genuine faith in Christ and somebody who's, who's just exploring. They, they look the same on the outside. You can't pick them out of a crowd. But there's still one thing that these explorers lack. And what they need is regeneration. They need God, the Holy Spirit, to move in them and to give them faith. In the language of John chapter 3, as Jesus talked to Nicodemus, they need to be born again. They need to be born from above, not just born of water when their mother's water broke. No, they need to be born of the Spirit. They need to have their eyes supernaturally open in order that they can see God as he is and that they can realize that he is beautiful and that he is desirable and that he is more satisfying than anything else that they'd seek in life. That God is more satisfying, God is more beautiful, God is more good, God is more desirable than money or sex or power or pleasure or anything. Validation, affirmation, whatever our idols are, through the gospel we realize that Jesus is the God that we want to pursue. And again, that happens supernaturally as God opens our eyes. As we believe the gospel, we learn to rest in the gospel. We learn to delight in the gospel. We, we stop working and striving to justify ourselves or to prove ourselves or to validate ourselves or to earn God's favor or to measure up to whatever the standard is, instead of trusting in our ongoing work and striving, we, we learn to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that is an ongoing process. But it is something that is supernaturally catalyzed by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and working through us and working on us. The difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is, is the person who realizes that they've been adopted by grace through faith into the family of God. That this man is now a son of the living God. That this woman is now a daughter of the king. It's a beautiful work that God does by his spirit. And again, it's not by merit. No, it is on the finished work of Jesus Christ, on his merit. That's what it means to begin the Christian life to follow him, to hope in him, to trust in him alone. That's what it means to be a disciple. Now, that's the beginning of the journey. It's not the whole thing. But this is the starting point of following Jesus that we're really seeking to lead everyone to. 
again, our, our, our friends and family, our classmates and co-workers, our, our neighbors and strangers. We want to invite them into a relationship with the living God. Outsiders, regardless of whatever their particulars are, outsiders, they need to see and experience and understand the love of God, both in the gospel and in God's people. Explorers, they need regeneration. They need new birth that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And we need to pray that God would supernaturally move because we cannot make that happen. It is the divine act that we ask him to do. So what about us? What do we need? If we hope to be effective in evangelism and inviting and sharing our faith and, and seeing other men, women, and children come to faith in Jesus Christ, what is it that we need? One thing, we need faith. We oh so desperately need faith. Most of us, when we think about evangelism and inviting, we're, we're, we're yeah, we need faith, but, but we're tempted to believe that what we really need is just a little bit more equipping, a little bit more experience, a, a little bit more skill, a little bit more knowledge. But as someone who has a lot of training and experience, I'll tell you, my desperate need is for faith. There are many days when 20 years ago that I was more effective in sharing my faith than I am on any given day to day. Not because I had more experience or training, I had so much less. Oh, but I will take anyone with a white hot faith led by the Holy Spirit over someone with experience and a seminary degree eight days a week. My friends, what we need is faith. We need faith to see through the facade to look past the mask that every single one of us in our society is wearing, Christian and non-Christian. This mask that says, no, I got it together, I got it figured out in the secular world. The, the mask that says, I don't need God. I am, I am satisfied without God. My life is going well. Now, there's a reality that there's this whole gradient of happiness and success and, and how people are doing in society, mental health, however you want to measure it. There's a reality that some people are doing better than others. There's a reality that many people feel no felt need for God. And yet by faith, we understand that there is no life that is truly life apart from the giver of life and the author of life. We understand that all of us were made to come alive and to thrive and to be most satisfied through a relationship with the living God. Humanity no more thrives apart from God than a fish thrives apart from water. It's just not how we're made. And we see that and we believe that and we live in light of it by faith. We need faith to see through the facade. We need faith to put to death our fear of rejection and social awkwardness and, and whatever those barriers are that, that would keep us from beginning the conversation, from, from walking across the room, from, from inviting someone to explore faith with us. Likewise, by faith, we seek Jesus Christ with a whole heart, and that is absolutely essential as we approach evangelism and inviting and sharing our faith, we need to seek Jesus with a whole heart because a half-hearted Christian faith, it simply doesn't work. I'm not getting into questions of, a, of whether you're saved or not. I'm just saying that practically speaking, day in and day out, the half-hearted Christian life does not work. It isn't fruitful. It isn't enjoyable. You want to have joy in Jesus Christ? Passionately pursue him with reckless abandon. Seek him and you will find him and it will be joyful, I promise you. Seek him half-heartedly and, and you'll just be torn in two all the time. It is a miserable way to live. It's like, it's like trying to be hot and cold at the same time. It's like trying to enjoy hot cocoa and cold lemonade at the same time. Okay, you, you put a straw in each of those glasses and you, you suck on those straws simultaneously, it will be a bad experience. They're not compatible. Likewise, the half-hearted Christian life. It, it's just not what God's called us to. It's, it's, it's not compatible with joy in Christ. You want to have joy in Christ? Cultivate your faith. 
pray that God would grow your faith, that he would help you to pursue him by faith, and you will have joy. And what you'll see in that joy is that your joy will naturally overflow into all of the relationships around you. You won't need somebody to tell you to share your faith. You won't need somebody to make you feel guilty and feel like, no, good Christians, they invite other people to church and they, and they talk to people about Jesus and they share the gospel. No. Man, if you are pursuing Jesus with your whole heart and you, and you make it your endeavor every morning, your first order of business is to make your heart happy in Jesus and to enjoy him, evangelism is going to take care of itself. Inviting is going to take care of itself, and that happens by faith. My friends, when we walk in faith, when we walk in joy, it is an overflow, and it is beautiful. Oh, that we would spend time in the presence of God, feeding our faith, multiplying our joy, and see evangelism work itself out. Again, by faith, we find the courage to walk across the room, to start the conversation, to go there. By faith, we realize that evangelism and inviting and any spiritually significant endeavor doesn't depend on us. And instead, we joyfully walk in desperate dependence on our Savior. And, and we recognize that every, every conversation, every syllable that we utter is by grace and for his glory. And we ask that he would infuse it with his power and use it for his glory. Most of all, the thing that we need is faith. And truly, faith is all that we need in this endeavor. But if I could give just, just one little attachment, one little addition, one other idea to consider as we think about evangelism and inviting, one other ingredient, it'd be initiative. Initiative to make a plan, initiative to feed our faith, initiative to... to to plan that next step and to take that next step, to start the conversation, to invite the friend deeper into our lives. Initiative and intentionality to open our eyes and explore the world around us and, and to recognize that, that Jesus was being honest and his words were true when he said, you know, look out at the fields, they are ripe for harvest. The harvest is plentiful and the labors are few. Oh, that we would open our eyes. Oh, that we would be intentional in taking an initiative for the benefit of others. Again, if, if we are enjoying Christ, we're not even going to have to wrestle with intentionality. It is going to come. But when we're struggling, when we're trying to get there, making a plan. Making a plan to pray. Again, to pray for our friends and family, our, our classmates, our coworkers, our neighbors, our strangers. Making a plan to pray for our own hearts that are often distracted and that are often hard, that God would fill us with his grace, making a plan to feast ourselves on the gospel of Jesus Christ so that when we feel like failures in the sharing of our faith, we would just take it as one more occasion to be reminded of his love and grace. My friends, if we do this, evangelism and inviting, it'll take care of itself. And my prayer is that we would be the people of faith who would see God work in that way. Amen.